Our sermon text is the gospel appointed for the feast of the Holy Trinity. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's text teaches both the doctrine of the Holy Trinity and the doctrine of baptism. These two articles of our faith are bound intimately together for the sake of our salvation. There is no baptism except in the name of the triune God. And there is no salvation with the triune God except through baptism. Today's gospel is our Lord's first teaching on salvation, as recorded in the Gospel of John. And it is significant that this first teaching combines so clearly the confession of the Trinity and that of baptism. For God desires that we associate his name not with judgment and fear, but with salvation and the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, he has attached his triune name to the sacrament of holy baptism. Now, the Trinity is confessed in the following way. Jesus says in verse 13, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. With these words, he plainly confesses himself to be God. For he says both that he came down from heaven and that he also remains in heaven. The Father is understood in the word heaven because he is the one enthroned in heaven from whom the Son of Man descended. Nicodemus himself understood this much, for he rightly calls Jesus a teacher come from God. As for the Holy Spirit... The Lord Jesus says that one must be born of water and the Spirit. He also says that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. That this Spirit is also God is clear from the fact that being born in him gives life and entrance into the kingdom of God. In this way, we have all three persons of the Divine Trinity confessed. And while we must distinguish between them, yet we must not divide them as though they were three different gods. For there is one God, as Scripture everywhere teaches. And this one true God has revealed himself to be in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> in today's gospel, the unity, or the oneness, of the Trinity is confessed by means of their one unified message. The Christ says to Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our message. This one witness is the gospel. That is, the entire doctrine of God. 
St. John explains this in his first epistle, where he writes, There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Thus, we can apply these words of St. John to our gospel text and see that just as the doctrine is one, so the Godhead is one, while there are three persons. In our epistle lesson, we find these words. Who has known the mind of the Lord? This teaches us to be humble. For the nature of God is far beyond our ability to understand. So also the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is a mystery which human thought cannot comprehend. While we can never understand the Trinity, nonetheless, we confess the Trinity. Insofar as the nature of the Trinity has been revealed to us in Scripture, The value of the Athanasian Creed, which we just confessed, is that it faithfully outlines what Scripture has revealed to us concerning the Trinity, without mixing in human opinion. It takes the various sayings of Scripture and combines them in good order, so as to teach from Scripture that there is one God in three persons, and that one of these persons, the Son of God, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, became man, suffered, died, and rose again for our justification. But how does that justification apply to us? It would be unfaithful to discuss the Trinity without discussing baptism. It is no coincidence that the clearest confession of the Holy Trinity is also the institution of baptism. For the Christ says to the apostles on the day of his ascension, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Notice that he does not say names, plural, but the name. For there is one name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For they are one God. In our appointed gospel text, baptism is taught in these words. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then, after saying this, the Christ repeats himself in clearer words, saying, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, to be born again is to be baptized by water and the Spirit. In the Lutheran symbols, we distinguish between the act of baptism on the one hand and regeneration on the other. The act of baptism is the outward speaking of the triune name 
and the applying of water. This outward act is the sacrament of baptism, where the triune name is applied to the washing with water, there is a true baptism, according to the institution of the Christ. Regeneration, on the other hand, is the inner fruit of baptism. It is the implantation of faith by the Holy Spirit and a creation of a new heart. If someone has been baptized and then falls from the faith, they are no longer regenerate. But their baptism remains true and valid. This is why we distinguish between baptism and regeneration. Because baptism is the promise of God. But the promise must still be received through faith. Which faith is given in baptism. But it can be rejected. And he who rejects the faith rejects also his baptism. Thus, we differentiate between baptism, the sacrament, and regeneration, the fruit of the sacrament. Nonetheless, regeneration happens through baptism. And even though, yes, it is in God's power to regenerate without baptism, he has commanded us that we should not look for regeneration or expect it anywhere else than in baptism. For Jesus says, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. By these words, we are commanded to reject and condemn every message of salvation which is not promised through the sacrament of baptism, as instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ. You may have noticed in the new hymnal supplement that the rubric or the directions, for the confession of sins reads thus, Then the baptized shall say. The assumption is that to be a Christian is to be baptized. And that to be a baptized one and to be a Christian are the same thing. Only the baptized confess their sins, because forgiveness is only promised through baptism. In this way, we can see from Scripture itself and from the confession of our liturgy that baptism is serious. It is more than a matter of life and death. It is a matter of salvation and damnation. God himself so highly exalts the sacrament of baptism that he has placed his own triune name upon it, that of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He who is baptized confesses the Trinity merely by being a Christian. Because there is no true baptism, except to be baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
baptism into any other name is not baptism and does not save. But he who has been baptized into that name has this sure promise from God himself that he has been given access to the kingdom of God. That is, his sins are freely forgiven and he is reconciled to the triune God so that he becomes God's child and a citizen of God's kingdom. Therefore, rejoice in your baptism and give thanks to the triune God. For he who is baptized is saved. These two articles go together. Baptism and the true confession of the Trinity. There is no salvation except in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You who have been baptized and who remain in baptism by faith and by the true confession of the triune God, you are born again. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.